By 2050, it is estimated that there will be 10 billion human beings on the planet, and every single one of them needs to be fed. Global GMP is projected to triple, and with this newfound wealth, massive pressures to feed the global population will occur. Unfortunately, feeding all these people will put a huge strain on an already struggling planet, and if nothing is done to combat this emerging issue, then the Earth could be pushed over the edge for good. The way we currently feed ourselves, especially in the developed world, is frankly massively unsustainable. The amount of land used, depletion of fresh water supplies as well as the amount of food that is wasted is staggering. If all the nations that are currently developing across the globe develop the same consumption habits as us filthy westerners, then we could have a massive issue on our hands. Oh yeah, and the food industry is also a massive emitter of greenhouse gases, with 5.2 billion tonnes of CO2 produced as of 2010. As you might be able to tell, things aren't looking too good when it comes to our food habits. In order to fully explain this issue, I need to introduce the concept of planetary boundaries. Planetary boundaries are a concept that some Swedish dude cooked up in 2009 to measure how utterly fucked we are in the grand scheme of things. So far, there are nine boundaries that we measure. Atmospheric CO2, which is pretty much just climate change, biodiversity loss, nitrogen and phosphorus levels, ocean acidity, land use, freshwater use, ozone depletion, atmospheric aerosols, and chemical pollution. The good news is that we've only passed four of these boundaries so far. However, we are also about to pass all the others in the next few years, bar atmospheric aerosols and chemical pollution, because we haven't actually measured these yet, so it could already be really bad. The main focus of this video is on the boundaries concerning climate change, nitrogen and phosphorus, land use, and fresh water. So the big question on everyone's mind is, what actually happens if we cross these boundaries? Well, let's take a look at the four I just mentioned, starting with climate change, because that's the easiest one. By this point, everybody in their dog knows that CO2 increases the greenhouse effect, and so on and so on, I'm not going to sit here and patronise you. All you need to know is that the planetary boundary for CO2 in the atmosphere is 350 parts per million, and we're roughly sitting at 400 parts per million. As you can see, things aren't going too well. Next are the more complicated boundaries concerning nitrogen and phosphorus. Honestly, the amount we as a species have fucked the global nitrogen and phosphorus cycle warrants its own video, but to summarise, we have essentially all but run out of phosphorus, and a lot of nitrogen is trapped in one stage of the nitrogen cycle. After that, there's the issue of land use. Essentially, we currently use 12% of the planet's surface to grow crops. If we exceed 15%, we're facing an issue with native plant loss, as well as the knock-on effects of soil erosion on a global scale, which could lead to massive loss in biodiversity. Last but not least is fresh water. I've already made a video on the issue of global water shortages, and the devastating effects that it can cause. However, we are some ways away from this boundary, as we currently only use 2,600 km square of water a year compared to the boundary of 4,000 km squared. Now that you know about the boundaries and the effects that will happen when they're crossed, what can be done about it, while also feeding 10 billion people that are soon going to be kicking around. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions can be done using one very simple method. Stop eating so many steaks. Unfortunately, all the tastiest animals produce large amounts of methane when they digest their food, which isn't too good for the environment. If everyone suddenly decided that bacon was overrated and shifted to a more plant-based diet, then we could reduce the impact of greenhouse gases on the environment by roughly 50%. However, that's never going to happen. The only way we can reduce red meat intake is by turning to government policy. Evidence shows that in order for dietary change to occur, we need our governments to do a number of things, such as changing the national food guidelines to be more ecologically minded, subsidising plant-based alternatives to red meat, and, I don't know, maybe don't chop down your most valuable natural resource to raise more cows. Looking at you, Brazil. The issue of nitrogen overuse is a tricky one as most modern farming practices heavily rely on nitrogen and phosphorus-based fertilisers in order to grow food. The main hope is that the technological and management practices in the industry can advance to the point where these vital elements are used more efficiently and recycled more. A heavy emphasis is placed on this boundary because unless we figure out a way to be more sustainable, we could be a bit screwed. Land use is an easy one, we just need to be more efficient with how we use our cropland. Using more efficient and less land-intensive farming practices needs to be rewarded in the form of tax cuts and subsidies by our governments. Not much can be done on an individual level about this one. Finally, we have the freshwater crisis looming on the horizon. Hopefully, our technology will improve by 2050 to the point where water use is more efficient when growing our food. However, better regulation will be key in reducing our water consumption to the point where we don't all horrifically starve. 
One way to do this could be by using grey water for irrigation, which is essentially all the water that comes out of your dishwasher and other appliances when they are used. By far the best way we can reduce our impacts across the board is by using a mix of all the strategies mentioned above. If everybody eats a little less meat and technology makes us a little bit more efficient, we really only need to have a lukewarm response to the crisis to put us out of the red and into the yellow, which is better than nothing. Well that about sums up this video. You might have noticed that most solutions involve government involvement and not individuals doing stuff, which might make the whole thing seem a bit daunting. However, it falls squarely into the hands of the individual to get out there and vote for the candidates to actually give a shit about these issues. Read some manifestos and look at the voting records for your local elections. And if you really care about all this environment stuff, then vote for the one with the best record on the environment. There we go, another thinly veiled climate change rant in the bag. If you want to watch another one, then go and check out my Water Wars video along with my Panda one, while also subscribing for more rants in the future. That's about it from me, remember to like and do all that other stuff while also having a good day.